Welcome and thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for this program. If this is your first time participating in a Cancer Support Community Atlanta program, we invite you to visit our website, cscatlanta.org, and complete a new attendee form to stay connected to all future programs. All right, it is 12 o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for being here. This is Emily Brown speaking from Cancer Support Community. I'm the program director here. Thank you for joining us for today's nutrition seminar on common questions and misconceptions about uh, nutrition and oncology. Um, so Kristen Kukulowski is the Oncology Clinical Nutrition Coordinator, and she does these monthly programs for us, for us and we're very grateful uh, for her donating her time to do this today. Um, so without further ado, Kristen, I'll go ahead and let you get started. Thanks, Emily. Um, as Emily said, I'm Kristen Kukulowski, and I am one of the oncology dietitians with Northside Hospital Cancer Institute. Um, we have a team of about 14 dietitians now that help service um, throughout the entire Cancer Institute that we have here. And I do know that some people get on from other hospitals or other systems, um, and most of the ones that are here in Atlanta also have dietitians on staff. So I just like to give a disclaimer that these presentations are more for just the general, not the general population, but the general, you know, oncology population. So it may not answer all of your individual specific questions that you have. Um, and so I do encourage you if you are still part of the Cancer Institute or part of another hospital system, if you want more individualized care, um, you can definitely make an appointment with one of the dietitians who can review your medical records and see what treatments you've been on and that kind of stuff. So without further ado, we will get started. Um, I just pulled some of the most common questions or things that patients say to me that may not carry a lot of truth behind them. Um, from just general internet searches um, and so things that either family members tell people or friends or just the media releasing information and it might not have the whole picture. So I really just picked four topics for us today and we have a lengthy slide deck. Um, so I'm glad that Emily is able to share that with you because um, you may have to reference some of this stuff if we're not able to get through everything in our hour that we have. But four of the most common questions that we tend to get um, working in this setting are, does sugar feed cancer? Or I have patients telling me that they've cut out sugar because it feeds cancer. Do I need to eat organic foods or can I have other foods too? Um, is soy food safe or my doctor told me not to eat soy or somebody in my family or friends told me not to eat soy? So we'll go through that. And then what diet should you be following to reduce cancer risk? And so there are a lot of diets that are out there and a lot of information. So we'll be going over the one that is actually recommended for cancer patients. Um, and we'll talk a little more when we get to that section. So first up, does sugar feed cancer? So the claim is that anytime you eat something that has sugar in it or breaks down to sugar, that it's feeding my cancer cells or causing cancer. So this is a very um, simple, statement for something that's much more complex that actually happens in our body. But in general, all cells in our body, whether they are cancer cells or your healthy cells that are just keeping you alive, all use sugar or glucose for energy. So glucose or blood glucose um, is the more scientific name. For this presentation, we're just gonna use sugar because in reality, that's what most people are used to saying. So sugar comes from all carbohydrate foods, which are our vegetables, fruits, whole grains, low fat dairy, and legumes. So a lot of people, I think when they say, I stop eating sugar or does sugar feed cancer, they're just thinking about like sodas or cakes and cookies and things that are very high in sugar. But you also have to remember when you say things like this, it also includes vegetables and fruits because our bodies break all of these foods down into the most simple form of glucose. Obviously, they're much more complex than just drinking something that's straight sugar. Um, so I just want you to keep in mind when you give big generic terms like this, it's harmful because in my mind, when a patient tells me they're cutting out sugar, I think you're cutting out all of these things. 
Um, and so we know that these foods are part of a very healthy diet and things that you need. And there actually are foods that fight cancer the best. Um, and so, you know, I freak out a little bit when somebody tells me that they're cutting sugar out because in my mind, I don't just think of high uh, fructose corn syrup or, you know, somebody drinking a bottle of Coke or those kind of things. I think that you are really just eliminating all these healthy foods too. So what do we know so far? So we cannot control which cells get sugar for energy. No matter how hard you try, you're not going to be able to direct a, a sugar molecule to any specific cell, meaning you can't send it to a healthy cell, you can't send it to a cancer cell. So, you know, that's very important to remember that you're not necessarily in control of where that's going once you have ingested it. So if you're not going to be providing sugar through your diet, meaning you're not eating carbohydrates, then your body's going to be forced to make sugar from other things. And we can make sugar from fat and protein to meet the needs of our cells. Like that's how important it is to have glucose for our bodies. Our bodies have the ability to make it from other stuff if we're not willing to eat it. So that's, I mean, that should be very telling that it's very important for our bodies to have these sugars um, because they do need it as their main fuel source. So if you do force your body into making sugar on its own, it has to get those proteins and fats from somewhere. And sometimes it's coming out of your diet, but also it's going to come from muscle. That's really where we store most of our protein. And then your fat stores that you have um, to be able to make the sugar and go through the metabolic process to do that. And so that can end up weakening your immune system because you're not nourishing your body the way that it needs to be nourished. Um, so that's important to remember. So even if you cut out every bit of sugar that you think that you can, your body's still going to make its own. So that's very important to remember. And then also remembering that there's no particular reason why sugar feeds cancer cells any more than it feeds all of your cells. And we'll talk a little bit more about that too, but that's just very important to remember as well. It is still a good idea to limit eating simple sugars. So just, you know, don't go running around saying my dietitian said I could eat all the sugar and that it doesn't cause cancer. That's not, you know, exactly what we're saying here. We want you choosing good complex carbohydrates and making good choices, but the theories that have been studied and show more promising research are when we eat a lot of simple sugars, our bodies produce a lot of insulin. And so insulin is the hormone that's made by our pancreas, and it helps to bring blood sugar in from your blood into the cell so it can actually use it as energy. And so insulin obviously signals sugar to go into the cell. It's kind of like a key to a lock. It helps it get inside. And then it also is responsible for increasing storage of calories as fat. So um, those are two of its main roles. But insulin helps to tell cells when to grow and that it's good to grow, which is great for our good, healthy cells. You know, we want things to be rejuvenating and to have good cell turnover, but if it's a cancer cell, it could also be encouraging that to grow more um, because our body's producing more insulin than it needs. Um, so the goal here is to avoid excess insulin production. You have to have insulin to live, you know, your body has to use it. So it's not that we want to eliminate it or even reduce it for a healthy person. We just want to prevent that excess insulin production from happening. And so there's several ways that you're able to do that. Um, but the biggest, most easy thing you can do is just avoiding taking large amounts of simple sugars at one time. In conjunction with that, you don't have to avoid all carbohydrates. We're just focusing really on those healthy, complex carbohydrates, and our best sources of those are fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes, or your beans, um, which are foods that already have those cancer-fighting properties anyway, so we want to include them, um, but they're going to prevent our blood sugars from spiking. And when our blood sugars spike, that's when our pancreas releases a lot of insulin. So because they're complex, they really help to slow down our digestion um, and it prevents that spike from happening. So you're getting a more, um, more like a slope instead of a mountain, if you will, when you're eating, if you like that visual. But the key is trying to combine foods with carbohydrates 
when you're eating them. So instead of having like two pieces of fruit as a snack, you could do one piece of fruit and have a handful of nuts. So you're then pairing it with a healthy fat, a protein, and even fiber in this situation, um, which will really help to slow down the digestion and you're not gonna see such a spike. Obviously fruit tends to have fiber in it. So, you know, a piece of fruit is much different than drinking a regular Coke um, that could cause a, a bigger spike for you. So anytime, you know, even if you're having like a piece of birthday cake for a random occasion, as long as you're eating it around a meal and you're just eating a smaller version um, or portion size of it, you're not gonna see such a spike as if you sat down and ate half the cheat cake and that was all you ate for your meal. Um, the other good example would be to think about fruit juice and eating the actual fruit. So um, people ask a lot about juicing and even if you juice at home by yourself, you're removing a lot of the pulp and the fiber out of those foods and you're leaving the juice part. So juice is usually just the simple sugars that are left, even though they're natural sugars, um, they're still going to have the same effect on your blood sugar where if you don't have anything else there to buffer it, like a piece of fiber, um, that you're gonna see that spike in blood sugar there. So if you're thinking about, you know, should I drink apple juice instead of eating the apple, obviously eating the apple is going to keep that protein, keep the protein, keep the fiber um, in there versus if you just had apple juice that doesn't have any fiber and is more just a, a concentration of more simple sugars. So I hope that makes sense. We're looking for those complex carbohydrates, which are your whole grains, legumes, fruits, and veggies. It helps to slow down the digestive process. And because of that, um, you're not gonna have that spike in insulin. And then you're also going to be getting all the good fiber, vitamins, minerals, and phytonutrients that we know help fight cancer. So avoiding all these things is not going to be beneficial to your overall health in the long run. Another key thing with these simple sugars, um, sometimes they're hidden in stuff. So. There are so many added sugars in our food system if you're eating processed or packaged foods. So I want you to be really cautious with added sugars. And um, just two big ways that we end up getting added sugars is we add it ourselves to something. So you're adding sugar to your morning coffee or to your tea. So you're adding it, it doesn't naturally occur in those foods. Um, so you just wanna be cautious there. But then also it's added by a lot of food manufacturers to processed and prepared foods. So there um, was a study that was done and they found that over 75% of packaged foods have extra added sugar in them. I was checking a bag of crackers that I had and they also had added sugar and you know they're very salty um, so you wouldn't think, oh, it has added sugar in it, but there was like three or four grams of extra added sugar um, because, you know, it's a processed food. So the new food label I've got posted up here on the screen actually helps to break down. Um, it's got total sugars and then it has added sugars. So yogurt is a good example because yogurt has some natural sugar from the lactose um, from the dairy products in it so that's going to be listed in the total sugars but then if it's a flavored yogurt that they're adding you know extra fruit or just helping to sweeten it's also going to have added sugars and that's where the added sugars is going to be coming from on here so for this example you've got 12 grams of total sugar and that includes 10 grams of added sugar there. So two grams are more naturally occurring in whatever food this is, and then 10 grams were added by the manufacturer to help sweeten the product um, or preserve it or whatever they're using the sugar for. So in general, the average American eats about 22 teaspoons per day of added sugars, which adds up to be about 70 pounds of added sugar per year. So you can see how this out of control pretty quickly. Um, so the recommendations from the dietary guidelines are that only 10% of our whole daily calories come from added sugar. Um, so we'll just use a simple example of a 2000 calorie diet. If 10% of your calories can come from added sugars, that's about 200 calories per day. And there's four calories per gram of sugar. Um, so that's about 50 grams of added sugar per day. So that's still quite a bit. Um, 
that's what they call their upper limit, like what they don't want you going over. It's fine if you're less than that. Um, and then 50 grams of sugar ends up being about 12 and a half teaspoons of sugar per day. So you can see if the average American is eating 22 teaspoons, they're almost double what the upper limit recommendations would be. So that's where some of this stuff comes in. And when they add added sugar into products like this, they um, just add extra calories. They're not really providing any additional nutritional value for us. Um, so that's uh, another reason why we tell people to try to lean towards more whole foods and staying away from those processed and packaged foods when you can, because they do add stuff in here so it tastes better. Um, and it's not really adding any nutritional value for you, just those extra calories, which can then lead to some weight gain, which we're also trying to avoid. So I get a lot of questions about sugar and people's PET scans because um, when you are taking the prep solution to go in and have your PET scan done and then your cancer glows on the PET scan because it's uptaking all that tracer, um, fluid that you drink to prep for your PET scan. It's not that the sugar is only reaching your cancer cells, it's that the hyperactivity or the higher metabolic rate of cancer is uptaking that sugar faster and that's what's ending up getting detected on the PET scan. So it's not that it's using it any differently than our healthy cells are, it's just more active and so it does take it up faster and that helps to show it on the PET scan. So um, the Mayo Clinic has done a lot of research around it and it's really just that cancer cells are more active than healthy cells are because they're dividing um, faster. And you know they've shown that restricting sugar intake does not slow down cancer growth and increasing sugar intake doesn't speed up cancer growth either. Um, so I hope that helps to settle some of that controversy. And then another comparison on how to look at that, our, our cells use sugar the ways that our cars use gas. So normal cells are reasonable and cancer cells tend to be more gas guzzlers. So try to tell people to think of your healthy cells as like a Prius. They're real fuel efficient, uh, just a little pump on the gas and you're, you're going. And then gas guzzlers are like big old semi trucks that are trying to go up a, a mountain. So during cell division, when our healthy cells are dividing to make more healthy cells, more glucose gets used during that time or more sugar gets used. So much like an accelerating car uses more gas after the cell division goes back to normal, um, then you're kind of in that idling state and you're not using as much sugar. But cancer cells are like cars that have their foot stuck to the accelerator. Um, and they're just using glucose at very high rates and they divide very quickly. That's why you're going through chemotherapy or immunotherapy or even radiation to try to get those cells to stop dividing um, so the cancer cells will die off. Um, so it's just that they're using a lot more. And again, we can't control which cells get what. And so, you know, it's kind of an uphill battle from here, but there's really no research showing that sugar makes cancer grow any faster or if you're limiting sugar that it's growing any slower. Um, but we do have some research around eating sugar and gaining weight um, that we'll talk about now. But there's no single food or food component and that includes sugar that can cause cancer by itself nor can it protect you against cancer by itself. You always have to have that variety of stuff um, to help protect yourself against cancer. You have to have a lifetime of good health. And, you know, I have people who run marathons and are vegans and, you know, they think they're doing all the right things and they still sometimes end up with cancer because your genetics play a factor or, you know, they're still trying to figure out all these different causes of cancer. So, you know, we're trying to keep our bodies as strong as we can and do the best that we can with the information we have now. Um, so there's never just a single food or food component, you know, sometimes I'll talk to somebody and they're like, oh, I'm only eating cabbage because I read that cabbage does this. Well, cabbage is always a healthy food and you want to incorporate it, but you can't just live off cabbage. You always have to have a variety of different stuff in your diet to really get the benefits of lifestyle and preventing cancer and other chronic diseases too, not just cancer. So um, in conclusion, there is really insufficient evidence showing a direct link between sugar intake and cancer growth. Avoiding sugar completely will not slow cancer. 
Um, eating a lot of high sugar foods could also lead to you eating excess calories, um, which leads to weight gain and excess body fat. And we do know that obesity increases the risk of 11 of the most common cancers. So we do want you to be a healthy body weight. It's the top recommendation from the American Institute for Cancer Research. And um, besides not smoking and using sunscreen, but you know, this is very important. If you're eating double the amount of added sugar in your diet every day, those are a lot of extra calories that could lead to this weight gain and excess body fat. So that's a different way of thinking about um, sugar in your diet or incorporating healthy whole grain foods. Um, so we do have strong evidence that a diet filled with a variety of plant foods, such as our vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and beans can lower your risk for many cancers, including cancer recurrence. So if you've had cancer, um, reducing your risk of having it recur and then increase your overall health and your immune system. So that's what I have on cancer and sugar here. Next up, do I have to eat organic or do I need to eat organic? So we'll go through a little bit about conventional farming versus organic farming. So conventional uh, farming applies chemical fertilizers to promote plant growth, where organic tries to use more natural fertilizers such as manure, compost, um, to help feed the soil and the plants. Conventional tends to use um, pesticides to reduce pests and diseases and organic farming tries to use um, beneficial insects and birds mating disruption or traps to reduce pests and disease use of herbicides to manage weeds and conventional where in organic they try to rotate crops pill weed mulch um, to help limit the weeds in conventional they may give animals antibiotics growth hormones medication to prevent disease or spur growth and then in organic give animals organic feed and outdoor access use preventative measures rotational grazing a balanced diet and clean housing to help minimize disease so sometimes people think that organic means that it's pesticide free and that is not always true so you really have to um, do your research on where things are coming from as far as that kind of stuff goes, um, you know, there's a lot of misinformation out there about conventional and organic. In general, in the US, it's been pretty well determined that our food supply is relatively safe. Um, so we'll go through a couple more things here. But organic does not always mean that it's pesticide free. That's important to remember. So organic versus con uh, conventional. There's no strong evidence that shows that organic fruits and vegetables provide more protection against cancer than conventional foods do. And there has been no consistent evidence that organic food is any more nutritious, meaning that it's higher in vitamins or minerals or other nutrients than conventionally grown foods. Um, so there are some, a few little studies that show like some sp very specific tiny instances that maybe a nutrient is higher in organic foods than in conventional foods and vice versa. So that's where that there's not any consistent information out there that has been researched yet. So why do people sometimes choose organic foods? So maybe it is because the lower pesticide residue, maybe because um, lower amounts of synthetic or man-made food additives in those foods uh, maybe you're more um, environmentally conscious, so better stewards of natural resources such as our land and water and really making sure the soil is overturned and um, that you're able to use farmland for a long time. Better stewardship of human resources, um, so the socially considerate of working and living conditions of laborers, needs of the rural communities and health of consumers. Um, so again, not every farm is the same as we know with all the news stuff that happens every day and things that get reported not every thing is going to always fall in the same category so just because you have an organic farm doesn't mean that you treat your workers better than somebody who has a conventional farm who also treats their workers great you know so you really have to research and kind of see where things come from these are just very blanketed statements um, of why some people might do certain things. So if you are picking organic and you have a food label on some of your foods, what do some of those labels mean for you? So if a product has that it's 100% organic, it means that all of the ingredients have to be certified organic in that product. 
Um, so obviously if you have an organic apple, it's really just the apple. Um, but there are other products that are, you know, processed or packaged stuff that will claim to be organic. So if it says 100% organic, all the ingredients have to be certified organic. If it just says organic, at least 95% of the ingredients are certified as organic. Um, if it says made with organic, um, at least 70% of the ingredients are certified organic. And then if it just says it's made with organic ingredients, then less than 70% of the ingredients are certified as organic, but they may include some things that are organic. So maybe you have like a local baker who makes muffins and they use organic blueberries in the muffins, but the rest of the muffin isn't really organic. So they might say made with organic blueberries. Um, so that's just a little example there. But there's always some kind of marketing scheme going behind some of these labels. So these are what they mean if you do see them printed on a package. Um, so in organic versus conventional, buying organic may make sense for you. Um, but the research that we currently have clearly shows that eating a wide variety of plant foods, such as your vegetables, fruits, legumes, and whole grains daily, in addition to being physically active and maintaining a healthy weight, is really what matters. So the research shows whether you eat you know, conventional versus organic, as long as you're able to get these plant foods in more than you're doing your processed foods and other things, that this is really where the benefit lies. It's not that it's because it's organic or it's conventionally grown. So, you know, organic foods can be more expensive, so they're not always in somebody's um, grasp. And if you have to choose between eating vegetables at all or buying an organic vegetable, I would rather you eat, you know, more fruits and veggies that are conventionally grown than trying just to limit yourself by buying just organic stuff. So everybody's in a different financial space. Everybody's in a different um, mindset of what your values are as far as the environment and what goes into your body. So right now the research doesn't send me any specific direction of how to guide you besides the fact that if you want to do it, it's not going to hurt you. Um, but if you want to switch to the conventional, then it shouldn't hurt you either. So for those who do get more concerned or do want to purchase some organic foods, but you're not really sure really where to start, um, there's an organization called the Environmental Working Group, and they create a Dirty Dozen and a Clean 15 guide every year. And I just recently found out that this guide actually only looks at conventionally grown produce. So they don't include organic stuff in this list. So this um, list on the next page here are the Dirty Dozen is the produce that has the most amounts of pesticides on them that are conventionally grown. So I don't know where organic strawberries would fall into this list because they didn't test them. They only looked at conventional grown produce for the list. So the clean 15 are the produce who have the least amount of pesticides. And again, this is just the conventional produce that's grown with pesticides and however else farmers do farming. So that's a very interesting uh, topic there. But I think Emily shared the Dirty Dozen Clean 15 Pocket Guide in the chat box with you. Um, so it's a cute little thing. You can cut it out and keep it in your wallet if you find that to be helpful um, for you. Long story short, eating your fruits and vegetables is more important than just focusing on being organic. Um, so, hope that answers that question. Is soy safe? This is one of my uh, favorite hot topics that has been coming up a lot recently. So, the current consensus among health experts who study soy is that breast cancer survivors can safely eat these foods. Most of the soy, most of the soy, most of the studies done around soy is on breast cancer. Um, usually people who have hormone sensitive cancers are more in tune to whether or not they're supposed to be eating soy or they're the ones who tend to have the most um, information and have done the most research. Um, just so you know why we're focusing more on breast cancer here. But um, some suggest soy is protective against breast cancer recurrence as well. Um, so there is less research regarding soy and other hormone-related cancers like endometrial cancer, prostate cancer, and ovarian cancer. Um, however, the studies that are available do suggest that soy foods are safe um, for those patients as well. So 
So the confusion about soy really comes from the term phytoestrogens. And phytoestrogens is a term that was founded because soy contains um, a component called isoflavonones or flavonoids, however you say it. And it's a chemical structure that looks like estrogen that's found in a woman's body. And so that's how it ended up coming to term. So phytoestrogen, plant estrogen. Um, so isoflavonones are not the same thing as female estrogen. Um, they can bind to the body's estrogen receptors, but they do it differently and they also function differently. So the avoidance was really recommended from a lot of misunderstandings about potential effects of phytoestrogen and the hormone sensitive cancers. But most of that research was done on mice and rodents, and they've since discovered that mice very much metabolize uh, soy foods differently than the human body does. Um, and so now that they've looked at more human studies and done more studies for humans and doing more observational studies, they've gotten a lot more clear picture of whether or not soy is actually safe. So now that we have these studies of survivors of breast and prostate cancer, um, they're really showing that there are no harmful side effects of having soy if you've had cancer. And they're actually showing that there could be a potential benefit um, of including soy as part of a healthy diet. So we'll dig into this a little bit more. So soy and breast cancer, common consensus from the health experts is that soy foods are safe for breast cancer survivors. There is emerging research suggesting that soy foods may decrease the likelihood of breast cancer recurrence. Most health experts agree that the evidence is not strong enough to recommend that all women with a history of breast cancer eat more soy, but if you like soy and you used to eat it and you want to eat it, then it is safe, but I'm not going to sit down and be like, you have to eat this. Um, you know, there's not that much research out there yet. So several large studies, thousands of women um, done on humans, not rodents, consistently show that compared with women who do not eat soy, um, women who regularly eat the soy have lower breast cancer risk. And then some studies also suggest that breast cancer survivors who consume soy foods have a lower risk of recurrence compared to those who avoid soy. So that is from our most current research that we have. The studies have been conducted in both Asian and US populations. And this is important because soy has been a long part of Asian cuisine for a really long time, but it's more relatively new to the American diet. So we haven't been consuming it for as long and it's not in, used in as many of our dishes as it would be in an Asian culture. So these studies are observational, so it's always possible that the true connection with better breast health is not the actual soy and people eating soy, but something else related to the soy. So an example of that, that would be women who eat more soy or have soy foods also eat less fried foods and eat more vegetables. They may also exercise more and maintain a healthier body weight. So it could just be a whole lifestyle and then they just also happen to include soy. Um, so it's just an observation that they looked at thousands of people and they had soy in their diets and what their recurrence risk was or what their risk of developing cancer was. In addition to that, soy foods diet and tamoxifen. So tamoxifen is a drug that a lot of breast cancer patients use as a maintenance therapy when they're done with their initial therapy. And so some doctors and patients have found, um, again, misconceptions and bad information out on the internet, but because of the concern around the phytoestrogens in soy foods, some people have recommended that women taking tamoxifen should avoid soy foods and that they're worried that it might undo the estrogen blocking effect that the medication is trying to do. Um, so ongoing research supports the opposite conclusion of that, though. So soy foods appear to enhance or improve the breast cancer blocking actions of tamoxifen. And there was a review of studies that was published in 2019 that polled 330,000 human participants found that soy protein intake was associated with a decreased risk in mortality of breast cancer. The food that's most of concern for women who are taking tamoxifen is actually grapefruit. Um, and so grapefruit is well known to interfere with a lot of medications and many resources recommend to avoid grapefruit while taking tamoxifen. Uh, do not drink grapefruit juice or regularly eat whole grapefruit. 
and there are no other foods known to have an interaction with tamoxifen or affect its absorption. Um, so there are still some questions around soy and its benefits, but this is what we know so far. So how much soy? You don't have to go out and eat like blocks of tofu or anything. We always want to keep everything in moderation. So a moderate consumption is one to two standard servings daily of whole soy foods such as tofu, soy milk, edamame, or soy nuts. Um, one serving averages about seven grams of protein, and that's got about 25 milligrams of the isoflavonoids in it. So an example of a standard serving would be three ounces of tofu or a third of a cup, one cup of soy milk, which is eight ounces, half a cup of edamame, and a fourth cup of soy nuts are some examples. So studies have demonstrated that up to three servings per day, which is up to 100 milligrams per day of isoflavonoids consumed in Asian populations, um, long term does not link increased risk to breast cancer. Um, so again, they tend to eat it more in their cuisine, um, more than American foods do. So if you're looking for a place to start, maybe a couple times a week, you don't have to include it. Um, but if you do want to, it does seem that it is safe at this time um, and may even have some benefits for including it. So it's always a controversial topic. And now we're going to talk about nutrition and diet. We're doing okay on time and reducing cancer risk. So this next part um, we've talked about for the last several months. I've tried to include it in every presentation that I can get it into, um, but it's really talking about the new American plate and what that means. So the American Institute for Cancer Research highly recommends having a more plant-based diet as a way to reduce cancer um, risk and also reducing risk of recurrence for a cancer that you may have already had. So what you're not going to find in this section is do I need to be on the keto diet? Do I need to drink alkaline water? Because those things aren't studied. Um, and if they have been studied, then they haven't been shown to be beneficial. But this diet in particular has been studied for a pretty long time now, and this is what the recommendation is. We can't always be at a super granular level of nitpicking, you know, should I be eating more broccoli florets than spinach, or are you know certain vegetables better than other vegetables? It's really about a variety and including as much color as you can and um, different foods and stuff on your plates and just trying to get all the good nutrients that are out of those foods um, rather than worrying yourself sick over did I get enough broccoli this week? You know, think of it more in broad terms of did I get enough vegetables? Did I get enough fruit? Am I focusing more on plant-based foods and eating less animal things? Um, you know, that will help to reduce your stress level of worrying about all the things that you are supposed to be doing. Um, and it just makes it eating a more pleasurable experience. So I like the new American plate. It's super simple. It comes with pictures. Um, you know, it just makes it easy, healthy eating way easier. So focusing on foods that are rich in fiber, vitamins, and phytonutrients to help protect against cancer. You can do a modest three ounce serving of meat, so fish, poultry, or red meat. Um, so there's a lot of people that don't eat red meat at all. That's perfectly fine. You don't have to eat anything that you don't want to eat. Um, studies show you can safely eat up to 18 ounces a week of red meat. Um, and then over that, you start getting into risk of colon cancer and some other cancers, um, but this is what they have studied and found to be safe so far. Three ounces of a piece of meat is about the size of a deck of cards. So I always like to point out, if you can remember back when we could eat at restaurants, uh, steaks tend to be anywhere from eight to 12 ounce steaks or even salmon fillets tend to be eight or 12 ounce serving sizes. So that's double, triple, quadruple sometimes of what the actual serving size is for our protein needs at a meal. So in general, as Americans and as a society, we tend to just overeat a little bit because we do like those big portions and value for our money when we're out to eat, including a variety of foods. So making sure you're getting a lot of different colors, like I mentioned, on your plate. 
And this is throughout a whole week. It doesn't always have to be at the same meal. Ideally, you would try to do it at the same meal, but some people, you know, if you live alone and you're only cooking for yourself and you don't want things to go bad, maybe your options are a little bit more limited by the day, but over the course of the week, you're able to get in more variety of different foods and that's okay. Um, trying to shoot for like two different kinds of vegetables on your plate at a given meal instead of just focusing on one. This will make sure that you've got, you know, a different color scheme going on. So in this uh, plate here, you've got some broccoli and some carrots. So you've got green and you've got orange going on. And then making sure that you also have a healthy serving of a tasty whole grain. Um, so whole grains would be like quinoa, brown rice, wild rice. Um, there's a bunch of different options that you can do, barley, um, oatmeal, all kinds of fun stuff in there that you can do. So you don't want to avoid, again, carbohydrates. You want to just make sure you're choosing the more whole grain options and um, going sticking with those. But I also like this plate just because it actually has real food on it and it gives you just a little bit different of a um, photo here. So. I like the plate method. This is an actual way of eating, like a tool you can use. It makes meal planning super easy. You have a plate and you're looking at it and you're like, something is missing and you don't have a vegetable on there. It's very easy to point out what you're missing, um, which really helps, especially if you're just getting started with learning how to meal plan. But it also helps to balance your nutrients. And then it really also helps with portion control. So this is a nine inch plate. So a nine inch plate tends to be more like a salad plate in the US, not a dinner plate. Um, if you are using a dinner plate, a lot of them have a rim around it. So maybe just using the inside part, the flat part of your plate um, is a good guide for how much food should actually be on your plate. Uh, so a fourth of the plate will be a protein of some kind and it can be an animal protein or it can be a plant-based protein. A fourth of your plate will be a grain or a starch, um, starchy like, vegetable, your sweet potatoes, regular potatoes, corn, you know, we don't count those up in the non-starchy vegetable section. And I do have those broken out and I did ask Emily to share this plate. It's a whole handout um, with you guys in the chat box and it's got all of these foods listed on the back side, um, what goes in what category. So it's very helpful for your meal planning. And then half the plate's gonna be non-starchy vegetables. So this specific plate has a salad of some kind. So it's got a lot of different vegetables in there, but you may do a fourth of the plate is broccoli and a fourth of the plate is carrots, um, you know, whatever veggies you tend to like. But if you can do, you know, one to two different vegetables on your plate, it's gonna give you just different colors and different nutrients in there. So here's a list of the non-starchy versus starchy vegetables. So our non-starchy, um, they have a lot of fiber and they don't have a lot of carbohydrate in them compared to our starchy vegetables. So the starchy vegetables, potatoes are the most popular, pumpkin, acorn squash, butternut squash, your green peas and corn are going to be over in that category. And then stuff like your summer squash, zucchini, onions, mushrooms, collard greens, beets, broccoli, you know, those are all going to be in your non starchy vegetable side. So here's a nice breakdown for you. And getting started. So I say this all the time, everybody's in a different place. I don't know what your plates currently look like or what your meals tend to look like, but really getting started is super easy. You want to put your plant foods first. So instead of being like, oh, I have a piece of chicken, and then trying to figure out what else you're gonna eat with the chicken. I want you to switch that over to your vegetable. Oh, I have a bunch of broccoli. What would taste good with broccoli? So you're really making your plants the star of your meals, and then you're using your other food, like your chicken and fish, as just a supporting role. Um, so it shouldn't always be the highlight of your meal. You really want to get nice colors and different plants in there, and then adding in that extra protein um, is kind of Again, the supporting role, I don't want to say afterthought because it's still important. You still have to have protein, obviously, in your meals. But I know just growing up, it was always, oh, we have steak tonight. It wasn't like, you know, nobody mentioned the vegetables on the side or anything. Uh, so that's just a different way to think about it. And then focusing on balancing your plate out with more whole foods. So a lot of these things aren't really packaged or prepackaged. It's okay if you have to get stuff that's already cut up because that's a barrier for you. You run low on time and so that prevents you from eating healthy. So if the grocery store chopped it up for you already, you know, that's perfectly fine. 
You can do fresh or frozen fruits and vegetables. I get that question a lot. Do I have to do just fresh? Again, if you live by yourself or there's only two of you, stuff goes bad really quickly. So there's no reason why you can't lean on frozen fruits and vegetables to help with portion control and to prevent things from going bad. You can also freeze your fresh produce um, if it's starting to look like you're not gonna get to all of it and you want to preserve it for the next week or later in the week, that's perfectly fine. Um, but either option is great. If you have to do canned stuff, you know, that's fine too. If you can pick a lower sodium option for your vegetables and really rinse it, until the water runs clear or you're doing canned beans, running it until the water runs clear to get all that excess sodium off is helpful. If you're doing uh, canned fruits, you can get them packed in juice instead of syrup. Uh, will help to save you some calories. Um, so those are always options as well. Some getting started tips, consider maybe doing like a meatless Monday or a meatless breakfast of some kind. You have to kind of evaluate what's going on in your life and again, what your plate typically look like or what your meals are looking like, um, but that's a fun way to try to get your protein from a plant-based protein instead of um, an animal protein. You can look at some of your favorite meals and what's missing plants. Like I do this all the time um, where I'm just like, okay, we've got the grain and we've got the meat, but we don't have a vegetable and some of my favorite dishes, I rotate different vegetables through and then I forget about the meat. So again, you just kind of, planning isn't necessarily an art. It just uh, takes a little bit of effort the first few go arounds, but you can always find ways to upgrade more plants into your diet um, if you sit down and, and really think about it. So you might have favorite stir fries and maybe your stir fry is currently really heavy on the rice. Can you decrease the rice and throw in more veggies? If you love omelets, can you add just a few different kinds of fruit, uh, fruits, uh, vegetables in there um, just to kind of give it a little bit of an upgrade? Um, so there's always fun things you can do, but you know, you don't always have to go online and find how to completely overhaul your diet. You can really start simple with some of your favorite things that you're comfortable cooking and figure out how to add stuff in and you'll be a little bit more successful than if you're trying to do a full 180 and get all these things in. And then just stocking your pantry, fridge, and freezer with whole foods and making sure that you have these things on hand. So again, if you like to do um, frozen vegetables and fruits and Kroger has a big sale or Publix has a big sale or Walmart, wherever you like to shop has a sale, you can really stock up on some of these things. So you always have them on hand. So if you do find yourself like, oh, what am I gonna eat tonight? You can always open up the freezer um, or your fridge and be like, oh, these are all the vegetables I have and this is what I know I can do with it because I planned out some of my favorite dishes. Um, so that really helps to spark stuff so you're not scrounging around at the last minute um, trying to figure out what you're gonna eat. All right, so these are just some pictures of transitioning your plate. So. We live in the South, this is very common, meat and potatoes uh, with some peas. So you've got two starchy vegetables here, peas and potatoes, and then you've got a really big piece of steak, which is like eight to 12 ounces, which would be normal for a restaurant. Um, and so this is what we're trying to transition away from. Even though it does have a little bit of color with those green peas, there's still a starchy option, which you can do. You just wanna make sure that they're a fourth of your plate and that you have other non-starchy options. So here's a, a stepping stone, stage two of transitioning. We've got a smaller piece of meat, maybe four to six ounces going on here. Um, it is a red meat, so we'll, kind of see the transition in the next uh, slide here, but there's a large helping of green beans, so almost half of the plate, but it's just one color, even though it's green. And then we've got a fourth of a whole grain of some kind sitting over there. So this plate's already starting to look better. And we get to stage three, so what that new American plate should actually look like. So three ounces of what I'm gonna call chicken here, and then you've got two different kinds of vegetables going on that are making up half the plate. And then you've got your whole grain still up there at about a fourth of your plate. Um, so it doesn't always have to look perfect every time, which is why I like the next slide, because it's all thrown together in a cute little bowl. Um, I love making these different bowls that you can do and just really adding in a lot of different stuff. But 
you know, still a lot of veggies going on here. You've got your carrots and your broccoli, and then it looks like a stir fry with some mushrooms and some scallions maybe, and there's probably some chicken in there. Um, you can have a lot of fun with these things. Um, the focus is on the plants, and you know what it looks like before you toss it all together. So hopefully that helps clear up some of those questions. I know there's always a lot of nitty gritty questions about specific foods or diets that are out there, but this is really the one that's going to, that shows the most promise as far as research goes with reducing our cancer risk. I've got some resources in here. People are always asking for the studies and the websites that I uh, found this information on. So those are also included if you want to take a look. But Emily, do we have any questions? Yes, we have quite a few questions, actually. Thank you so much for that presentation. All right, our first question, are alternate sugars not included on the sugar labels? We recently looked at something that had Splenda in it, but it showed added sugars at zero. Yeah, so Splenda doesn't have any calories in it, um, and neither do the artificial sweeteners. So those aren't going to be listed in the total added sugars because they're not providing really any nutritional value at all, like no calories, nothing. Um, so that's probably why they're not listed. So they should be listed under the total, like the ingredients area, so you can see what is causing the sweet taste, um, but it's probably not going to be included on the label as an added sugar. Okay, and soy and TNBC, which is not hormone related? What is TNBC? Triple negative breast cancer. So usually, I mean, soy has been found to be safe. They mostly have been doing the research on the hormone sensitive cancers because of the phytoestrogen that we talked about. And that was people's like alert um, up front. Um, so I don't know that there's been any specific triple negative breast cancer research done with soy. I'd have to go back and check, but it seemed in general um, that since it's a plant-based protein and a plant-based food, um, I don't know why it would be singled out just for triple negative breast cancer. I think okay. it would follow the same guidelines as being considered safe. Okay. Thoughts about glucosamine supplement given by a nutritionist during chemo? Should they continue that? Um, if you were given it for a specific reason and it was related to the chemo, usually it might be for neuropathy or um, mouth sores. So if you're no longer on the chemo and you're not at risk of having those side effects from happening, you probably don't need to continue taking it. But if somebody recommended it to you, you can always give them a call and ask if you need to continue taking it. All right. Is there any risk with using soy protein powder products? So in the research that I found while looking for this presentation, it didn't seem that there was really any difference from the whole soy products versus more supplement products. Like I wouldn't necessarily take something that was just the isoflavonoids in a, in a capsule, but it seemed that people were worried that if you made it into like a protein powder, that it was going to increase those isoflavonoids, but they found that that was not the case. Um, so it seemed that it was going to be the same as if you were eating a soy product like an edamame or tofu. Um, so I think the most current research is showing that it should be safe. What about drinking one cup of coffee daily? Is that good or bad for breast cancer? Uh, that should be fine. Can you comment on Avista with regards to soy? Does Avista also work to block estrogen production? Um, I don't know what Avista is, but I can look it up and try to get you the answer. That's E-V-I-S-T-A. Is pasta a whole food or a simple sugar? Um, a pasta would be considered a, um, it's not a whole food necessarily, it is processed. Um, but you've got plain white pasta, and it's still gonna be considered a complex carbohydrate because you've got a lot of molecules in there. And then a better option would be a whole grain pasta, so something that's got more fiber in it that's going to come from more of the, it's gonna be whole wheat pasta or whole grain pasta is less processed than just a simple white pasta would be. Hopefully that makes sense. So it's not necessarily a simple sugar because it does have other components to it, um, but the better option is to focus on like a whole grain or a whole wheat uh, pasta because it's got more fiber. 
Okay, and is silk almond milk with low sugar a good alternative to 2% milk for a newly diagnosed um, type 2 diabetic? Silk almond milk with what? Low sugar. Yeah, it can be an option for you. So the almond milk and any of the nut milks really don't have a protein in them. They might have two or three grams compared to um, cow's milk or even soy milk has more protein. So if you're using it as a protein food, you can't really use almond milk as that. But if you're just using it as an enhancement to something, like you like it on your cereal, but you're also eating other forms of protein throughout the day, then yes, it's perfectly fine to use that. All right, thank you so much. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed the presentation for today and it was recorded, so we will have that posted on our website, cscatlanta.org, uh, in the coming days after we have that downloaded and edited. Um, so that will be available to you. And thank you again, Kristen, and we will see you again uh, next month. Thank you. All right, take care. Thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for this program. If you're interested in other live or recorded programs, please visit the online program tab of our website, cscatlanta.org. Or follow us on Facebook. We'll be sharing additional information on upcoming programs.